As there is but one body and spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, so we may be all of one heart and of one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth glorify you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. As today we reflect on the Lambeth Conference, with particular reference to it's one of its documents called To Full Humanity. And in this lecture, we will look at some of the ideas that came out of Lambeth Conference and how it actually got going in the first place. And we begin at 1998, because the 1998 Lambeth Conference was particularly disruptive because of its preoccupation with human sexuality. Nonetheless, the Lambeth Conference is an event filled with all the elements of a truly great human story. The story of Lambeth 1998 includes almost the entire cocktail, which we find irresistible not to drink. The ideas of jurisdiction, the place of community, external consultants, the role of an archbishop, disputations over interpretation of classic texts, and the ultimate authority of God. Thrown into the cocktail is the global nature of the contemporary church and the pluralism represented in the great mixture of cultures. If we but pause a moment to view the Lambeth landscape, all of this becomes clearer still. One writer, Stephen Platon, leads us into a surreal picture shattered only by the controversy that providence unfold onto the pages of history. Platon writes of the scenery at the garden party in Buckingham Palace. It's an extraordinary panorama. More than 750 bishops from the communion, over 650 spouses, numerous consultants, plus the hundred or so members of the Anglican Consultative Council. In the garden that day, an exotic pattern formed from the conjunction of champagne-colored silk dresses, straw hats, great swathes of purple, and the magnificent example of national dress from around the world, and of course, the queen and her entourage moving through the midst of this great concourse. The phrase, the Anglican Communion, may have emerged at a time of celebration, a novel concept among Anglicans, but conflict and controversy lingers over it. It is believed that the best records suggest that the term was first used at the 150th anniversary of the United Society for the Propagation of the Gospel celebration in 1851. And we can see Norman Edwards for this reference. But the first embodied attempt at communal existence, the Lambeth Conference, was born in conflict and controversy. And as always, conflict and controversy keeps threatening the communion. What will help us? What will help us not to have this notion 
of an Anglican communion become just part of the rubbish heap of history? Will the notions of tradition, scripture, and reason stand if they are separated from the Lambeth quadrilateral? Or will the Anglican communion emerge stronger if more focus is placed on the theological with the necessary institutional support? Over the period of, the, of this lecture, we will look at those things, the Anglican Communion as reflected in the Lambeth Conference. And so what is the context of this document called to full humanity? It speaks of issues and answers questions, perhaps, that were never contemplated, far less to address. The document explores six themes namely human rights and human dignity, the environment, human sexuality, modern technology, euthanasia, international death, and economic justice. As this indicates, we will look mainly at human rights, human dignity, and human sexuality. Some of us would have heard from Elias. And some of us know of the book by Chinua Achebe, Things Fall Apart. And when things fall apart, we wonder if the center can hold. But in Anglicanism, this is a problematic concept for it assumes that there is a center. But within Anglicanism, it is difficult to locate a center. Even more telling is perhaps the idea that the Anglican Church has always shied away from placing someone or something at the center. Yet, the gravitation towards the Archbishopric of Canterbury may suggest that the idea of a central point of reference is not totally unacceptable. Hence, we must work with the notion of contingency as one of the core metaphors of how we understand the church. But we take into account the influence of particular cultures in order to create space for who we are and what we do as church. And when we speak of the Anglican Communion, we speak as though it is an established fact or a clearly definable entity. But historically, it is of recent vintage. It is still emerging. The structures are weak and lack any coherent ecclesiological concept, except perhaps the notion of dispersed authority. Furthermore, the theological foundation is being worked out with each new conflict. Stephen Platton states, perhaps we should not be too alarmed when we discern imperfections with the Lambeth Conference or with the other instruments of communion. We are still working on an ecclesiology in the making. This is to take the divergences lightly to say the least. Yet, gradually, a new consensus is emerging. For example, the Lambeth Conference Inter-Anglican Theological Doctrinal Commission, set up in 1988, produced what is called the Virginia Report. And this report argues thus, a deeper understanding of the instruments of communion at a world level and their relationship to one another and to the levels of the church's life should lead to a more coherent and inclusive functioning of oversight in the service of koinonia of the church. When the ministry of oversight is exercised in a personal, collegial, and communal way, 
embodied with the principles of subsidiary accountability and interdependence, then the community is protected from authoritarianism that will only serve the personal and not the whole church. Clearly, what they recommend will take vision and hard work, especially from those who we acknowledge that the only point of coherence is historical inheritance. At the moment, one may argue that the notion of dispersed authority or autonomy is the trademark of Anglicanism, and it would be hard to find a diocesan bishop willing to share jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is a key element in the church's organizational operation. So for example, would Leopold allow the Bishop of Barbados to come down here and dictate to him? We have always held that the Pentecost event is the birthday of the church. And the Pentecost event shows us that the church, from its very beginning, was universal and is therefore a faith community with a Catholic horizon that values diversity in unity and unity in diversity. In today's world, however, there is such a bewildering array of so-called images of the church that we need to ask anew, what is the church? It is disconcerting that the watchword is globalization in a world where the local option is king. When the local does not help us to understand the universal, but rather becomes another word for selfishness. Where and how we can recapture or formulate what is the essence of the church? How far does communion or community express what we mean by church? What are some of the issues that have historically concerned the Lambeth Conference? And so let us take a brief look at the circumstances leading to the first Lambeth Conference and the Kikuyu controversy and see how those will help us to understand better the Lambeth Conference in relation to the Anglican Communion. The first Lambeth Conference was in 1867. The circumstances were exceptionally difficult. Dewey Morgan writes that some of the interest at stake was so keen and even personal assault that the bishops found it hard to give un undistracted attention to the wider questions of policy and practice, which included in Archbishop Langley's program. We introduce a name, John William Calenzo. He was to force the church to search his doctrinal heart. Calenzo was a mathematician by training, and he became the bishop of Natal in South Africa in 1853. Just three years before, the church in South Africa had openly revoked any powers of the British government, had over appointing bishops under the leadership of Bishop Robert Gray. It was Gray himself who appointed Calenzo. Calenzo's character and the social and intellectual climate clashed, causing an explosion. Firstly, he refused to condemn sexual practices of the African converts, namely polygamy. Locally, this may have ruffled some feathers. Perhaps he would never have become more than a domestic issue in South Africa, since polygamy was not a pressing issue 
for an English church in mid-Victorian days. Calenzo was very passionate about his beliefs and no one could have any doubt about his sincerity. Accordingly, in 1861, Calenzo published two books. One, a commentary on the epistle to the Romans, and the second was a devastating criticism of the Pentateuch. In this commentary, Calenza gave unorthodox interpretation of some of the central Christian doctrines. Around the same time, Frederick Temple and Benjamin Jewett had joined other prominent men in disseminating dangerous views in essays and reviews. And only a year after Charles Darwin had published his work. Members of the clergy of the Church of England were also starting to dabble with biblical criticism. So it is no exaggerating to say that the debate raged hotly. Perhaps, again, had Colenza been a lonely voice, little would have happened. Davidson says of the 1867 conference. The first official step in connection with the assembling of such a conference was taken, not in England, but in Canada. The notion had indeed been in the air for many years, both in England and abroad. And the final impulse which brought about a conference was eminently significant of the changed conditions of the church. It arose, strange to say, from the interest awakened in North America by the affairs of South, Amer South Africa. Bishop Gray and the English bishops were worried to say the least, but no one seemed to know what could be done. What then was to be done about Calenzo? How could Calenzo be condemned? How could the church escape its responsibility of condemning teachings so much at variant with itself? The reaction was furious. Almost with one voice or with one stroke of the pen, the English bishops prohibited him from preaching in their dioceses. Locally, Colenzo was tried, found guilty, and excommunicated. He appealed to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who uphold Bishop Gray's position. Here, obviously, was a critical issue. A man holding full Episcopal orders and in charge of a diocese was not acceptable to his Episcopal brethren. The effects could be far-reaching and could indeed split the Anglican Communion. The matter had spread far beyond England and South Africa. Echoes of Colenso was being heard in Australia and America, and above all in Canada. Hence, one was to be the in Darwin's Origin of Species, Essays and Reviews, and the church held because the matter was perceived as doctrinal, but another African controversy took center stage. What emerges, unfortunately, is that the first Lambeth Conference was born in response to controversy, rather than a conscious being of an ecclesiastical stand. Given its confrontational nature, compromise followed, and compromise has been a key feature of Lambeth ever since. The nature of the controversy, largely due to Colenso, has in many respects determined the continuation of the Lambeth Conference, and consequently the shape and structure of the Anglican Communion. 
1910. Let us be clear that we are not the first to face serious challenges to the coherence and integrity of our communion. The conflict and controversy seem to always feature before, during, and after the Lambeth Conference. In 1913, it was not only the chanceries of Europe which was striving to avert a crisis. The legal advisor of certain Anglican bishops was similarly occupied. The Bishop of Zanzibar stirred the Church of England and the Anglican Communion by accusing the Bishop of Mombasa and Uganda of heresy and promoting schism. He demanded a public recantation. The immediate object of their concern was an indictment. We, Frank, by divine permission, Lord Bishop of Zanzibar and East Africa, do by these present accuse and charge the Right Reverend Father in God, William, Lord Bishop of Mombasa, and the Right Reverend Father in God, James John Jameson, Lord Bishop of Uganda, with grievous faults of propagating heresy and committing schism. Dewey Morgan and Stephen Sykes agree that the initial combatants were Bishop Frank Wesson and the Bishop of Mombasa and Uganda. While there are disagreements on other matters, Morgan states, there is no doubt whatsoever that the Bishop of Zanzibar's conciliatory spirit, large-heartedness, clear-mindedness, and passion for reunion together with a quite remarkable power of draftsmanship were the predominant forces. Morgan is of the opinion that the immediate cause of the indictment was a single incident. In June 1913, there was an attempt at the Federation of Protestant Missions in Africa. The bishops of Mombasa and Uganda were part of the conference. The conference ended with all missionaries, irrespective of denomination, coming together to receive the Holy Eucharist in a Presbyterian church. The celebrant was the Bishop of Mombasa. Stephen Sykes characterizes Wesson as an Anglo-Catholic controversialist. Not that I agree. I'm saying what Wesson says. There is an unnecessary, this is an unnecessary and uncalled for characterization if one accepts Morgan's claim. Sykes acknowledges that the issue of Holy Communion, but he suggests that the purpose of the conference warrants greater consideration as the reason for the accusation. According to Sykes, in November 1913, it had become apparent that the issue at stake was the precise ecclesial character of the proposed federation. Hence, one could summarize that at the heart of the matter was ecclesiology. Those were the issues, but much more lay behind them. Frank Wesson regarded the possibility of intercommunion as a sign of decay which the liberals were bringing upon the Church of England. When Henley Henson, a liberal, was consecrated Bishop of Harford, and Charles Gore entered on the side of Wesson, the slumbering fires of controversy flared to a new heat. Both sides closed their ranks and prepared for battle. Furthermore, the resurrection narrative the miraculous elements of the, in the Gospels and the virgin birth were all under attack and the faithful were perplexed. The stage was set for a dangerous controversy. An appeal was made to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Fortified by the Anglo-Catholic fraction, Wesson arrives at Lambeth. Frank Wesson entered Lambeth 
with a well-known name and an unknown personality. Should Anglicans receive communion in a Pentecostal church? Or in a Methodist church, the question in the KKU controversy was: Should the Bishop of Mombasa even been there, much less to consecrate and then to distribute communion to all and sundry? Remember, this is nineteen. 13. Perhaps the world has changed since then. So we come up a little closer. November 2nd, 2003. The consecration of Gene Robinson. As the one could have cut atmosphere with the knife. Their garments were pressed to perfection and shone. Those who were there knew that something significant was about to happen. But as to the magnitude, no one had a clue. This was the space where tradition and transition erupted like a volcano. The warning signs came. Unlike the animals taking a defensive or decisive action, humanity demonstrated behavior on a continuum from disregard to utter shock. The lights went on. Electricity flowed through with a purposive tension. The building looked solid, as though it had withstood many moons and changing seasons, resolutely fulfilling its purpose. Its purpose had not changed, but the people had. The words sounded the same, but their intention started perhaps, it is more accurate to say accelerated rather than started a chain reaction. Here stood bishops of God's church, consecrating an openly professed homosexual to the highest office of the church. Thus repudiating Lambeth Conference Resolution 110, we reject homosexual practice as incompatible with scripture. On a vote of 526 to 70, with 45 abstentions. The autonomous nature of the Anglican dioceses came out immediately following the resolution on homosexuality. At a press conference, about 100 bishops voiced their disapproval of the conference resolution. What happened in New Hampshire? Was it not predictable? It's not my intention to pursue the details of these fascinating controversies further, but their relevance to our own day is obvious. Although different in intention and consequence, the above-mentioned controversies brought to the fore questions about the very nature of the Anglican Church and the emerging notion of Anglican communion. Moreover, such controversies continue to determine the very structures evolving to embody the Anglican communion. Events in a part of the Anglican communion provoke acute controversy in that place, because leading bishops and theologians hold contradictory views on the matter. The disagreement is considered sufficiently important by one of the parties to appeal to the Archbishop of Canterbury to decide it. The Archbishop grasps the fact that modern communication imposes on him the necessity of responding to an issue, which is of general relevance to the communion. He requests an existing international body of bishops to advise him, consider their advice, and writes his own judgment. 
all of these features bear upon the argument that we are currently having about Christian teaching and homosexual relationships. Interestingly, none of the combatants consider that the Archbishop's judgment closed the matter, but partly they continue to be controversial. So what do we then anchor this document call to humanity and its emphasis on human rights and human sexuality? The authors use the notion of applied theology that seeks a two-way process, faith informing practice and practice informing faith. And so the document sets out a four-prong approach based on notions from applied theology, namely, analysis of the situation, theological reflection, putting into context, and practical application. The church is portrayed as a community rooted in scripture, aware of the demands of the kingdom. And the document states that the Lambeth Conference 1998 and more recently, the Virginia Report have articulated well how Anglicans approach the question that life situation asks by prayer, by worshiping the context of the resources of sacred scripture, tradition, and reason. More importantly, they are meant to determine its ethical engagement with issues of human rights, dignity, and sexuality. As may be expected, the theological application is inconsistent throughout the document. Additionally, in matters related to human rights and sexuality, the document applies theological principles differently. For example, biblical theology and eschatology are the resources employed in relation to the issues of human sexuality, whereas the church as community is the basis for its reflection on human rights and dignity. It states, it is not simply our sexuality which finally determines or defines us as human beings, but our relationship to the triune God who loves us com and completes us. Drawing from the South African context, Stephen de Gucci makes a case for the church's struggle to secure human rights and links it to the issue of human sexuality. He asserts, this search is of course rooted in biblical vision of human rights and the provision of justice for all citizens. Matters about which the church usually speaks openly and clearly but our gender justice is entwined with our social construction of what it means to be male and female. And this in turn is rooted in our cultural understanding of sexuality. The incapacity of the church to deal with human sexuality in anything other than patriarchal mindset has a mystifying effect upon this demand for justice. It is abundantly clear then that the struggle against patriarchy is a vital challenge for the church and will require of the church a greater maturity in dealing with matters of human sexuality within the framework of human rights. De Gucci's notion of the need to view human sexuality within the framework of human rights emerged from a biblical vision and is the most helpful approach if this is coupled with a portrayal of the exalted Jesus as the one who fulfills humanity's calling, it therefore offers the church possibility for a more comprehensive analysis of the problem in those areas. The document does assert that Jesus restores humanity as made in God's image. Our concerns about human rights and gender issues need to be rooted firmly in the notion of humanity as made in God's image. 
Hence, both human rights and sexuality speak to the issue of the nature of humanity. From this perspective, men and women are created equal, equally yet different, and are meant to live in communities with respect, cooperation, justice, and where love prevails, not manipulation, not control, not discrimination. The Gucci's work has shown that at the sociological level, one can link human rights and sexuality with the notion of justice. Perhaps one may work with human rights and human sexuality through our understanding of who Jesus is and how we express that in church. One can therefore glean from the onset that the Lambeth Conference concerned itself with local issues that had international repercussions. A direct consequence of this is the way the Anglican Communion becomes more solid, along with the emergence of instruments of consultation. Over the years, the Lambeth Conference closes with a collection of numbered resolutions offered for popular approval. The word conference suggests that the resolutions are merely declar declaratory. They would have only the influence of recommendations. Notably, very few bishops shows any intention of translating resolutions into action. Most of them prefer to continue as Lord Bishop in their diocese without reference to a synod or conference. Furthermore, we have seen that ethical issues might have ecclesiolo ecclesiological impact. Humanly speaking, one would say that the Lambeth Conference was foredoomed to fail. But surely one thing has emerged. When we speak of the church, we do not speak humanly. The Lambeth Conference is the great demonstration of the fact that the Anglican Communion is unique in the degree to which it is at once confers freedom from authority, yet gain an inner harmony which defies logical analysis. It is with this in mind that we ask ourselves, how does this document, Call to Humanity, reflect who we are as church? We come up against a problem immediately because the document strategy of a fourfold method of presentation, namely situation, theological reflection, putting into context and practical application makes the language of the document very difficult to follow. Just like how you have you fallen asleep now. The intention here is to be selective with reference to primary but not exclusively to human sexuality, believing that the language choice is fairly representative of the overall document. The analysis of the word choice will be done in conjunction with the resolution as reflective of the mind of the conference by implication and implication for the Anglican Communion. Prior to the 1998 conference, Bishop Duncan Buckingham of the Diocese of Johannesburg of the subsection on human sexuality is reported to have said, there are some people who want to say that the question of homosexuality is not fundamental to the faith. Others say that it is. What can vary is to try to balance a whole lot of them. One does not envy this chairman. The resolutions will show the compromise. But even then, the battle lines were drawn 
and the after effects are haunting us now. There is always a peculiar and particular difficulty, if not impertinence, to attempt an analysis of a document produced by a committee. The document might be best understood as a methodology which seeks to hold in tension contradictory principles while searching for a compromise. The head of the section, Archbishop Nangulu, cries out, our work was intensive and arduous, hammered out on the anvil of pain. He continues, it is an understatement to say that the subsection on human sexuality has been far from straightforward. Here, our different cultures, theologies, and understanding and interpretation of biblical texts nearly broke any chance of coming to some sort of agreement on the question of human sexuality. The document agrees to acknowledge diversity of practice within communion. Hence, at the plenary, one can understand Bishop David Russell's pleading. It was an amazing coming together Please, please do not crush that achievement. Hence, the document uses the term asserts. The conference can assert on behalf of all that no part of human life is excluded from God's care and concern. From its inception in 1867, the conference saw itself namely and mainly as an advisory body. It has never been contemplated that we should assume the function of a general synod of all the churches in full communion with the Church of England and take upon ourselves to enact canons that should be binding upon those represented. We merely propose to discuss matters of practical interest and pronounce what we deem expedient, which may serve as safe guidelines. One wonders when the document states the conference cannot lay down guidelines. One may not expect such words within the document, given the place of bishops within the Anglican Church. Perhaps the laying down of guidelines would be a natural step. There is a small matter of diocesan autonomy. That is, each bishop is free to act in his diocese. One is dealing with an animal of many spots. If one recalls that the first Lambert Conference was purely about declaration, and that it has, it has remained the case to this day, then the guideline notion is quite understandable. The bishops were very careful to avoid calling the gathering of bishops a council of the church. It was and remains an informal meeting of bishops who are in communion with the of Canterbury, to permit them to pray together, to consult together about matters of common concern. And so the document is clear. The Lambeth Conference is primarily for bishops. They are called to serve, to oversee, and to guide the church. The Virginia Report claims that at the Reformation, the Church of England maintained the threefold order of ministry in continuity with the early church. Bishops in their diocese continue to be the personal focus of continuity and unity of the church. In time, this developed into synodical structures which bring together ordained and lay for discernment, decision-making, and authoritative teaching. Although the claim of continuation of the threefold order of ministry is disputed, the bishops who gathered Lambeth see them, saw themselves from the first conference as continuous with the faith and worship of the historic church. Naturally, here one notes that the continuity spoken of is with the Latin church, not the Orthodox church. Though perceived as continuous, the ministry has evolved. This evolution has not always been smooth. As noted above, sometimes strides were made simultaneously with setbacks. But the notion of bishops as the guardian of the faith 
remains strong within the Anglican Church. I would want to stop there and we'll continue next time. And so we see that the Lambeth Conference came out of controversy and conflict. And the conflict and controversy continues to somehow be part and parcel of the way in which the Anglican Communion structures itself and understands itself. But even within that, the bishops do not wish to give up their jurisdiction to anybody. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yes? See this? This is red, right? So you have to pull up on it, so I can answer that question. <laughs> this, this doesn't have any purple in it. This is, this is red. See? This is red. Um, there are some Anglican churches that will say that unequivocally, and there are some who it is an unspoken thing, and yet there are others who would clearly and would announce that it's an open table. And that is the very, and that is the, that's the nature of the Anglican animal. You have different positions that try to hold together in one space. So you would have, and sometimes, the priest who may, have, who may make that pronouncement that um, only confirm uh, Anglicans could come to communion may make that statement in contradiction of his bishop. And the one who pronounces that it is an open table may make that declaration in contradiction of his bishop. Okay? And so we have these, this width Within, within our ecclesial body that sometimes can be mystifying. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, me. Um, the and I gather that at this stage, the Mm-hmm. Our church. 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 This church. Church in the province of the church in the diocese of the Windward Islands or the church in the province of the West Indies? Province of the Windward Islands. Diocese of the Windward Islands, okay. Uh -huh. Homosexuality as an example of sin. 
Was there a question? Uh, I don't. Was there a question? A statement? I, I, no need to me. Oh boy, it's one thing. One thing when I. One thing when I stand up here, I'm on a spot. I'm on a spot. Mm -hmm. So you have never. You said you have never heard in. The declaration that homosexuality is a sin coming from our church. Okay. And that disturbs you, or you're glad to hear that? No, I'm just observation. Oh, just an observation. Okay. Sensitive. Sensitive. Oh. Oh. Okay. No, my. I... Yes. But for me, I mean, if. You... I have written in the newspapers years ago about these things. That's why I don't even. That's why I don't bother. I mean, I was very clear. Um, homosexuality has nothing to do with human rights. It cannot be argued on human rights grounds. And though we make a distinction between. Homosexual practice and homosexual orientation. We have, I mean, the literature is, is filled with, with differentiation. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, it comes down to how we understand our createdness. And for me, I stand. From a New Testament perspective, with Romans 1, 25 and following. That is where I take my stand. I do not, I would not condone homosexual practice, but I am fully aware that within our society and within our church, there are persons who it is rumored. It is asserted, it is suggested, are homosexuals. I don't know what is going on in people's bedroom, and I don't want to know. My stand has always been, make sure you record this. And the bishop might fire me tomorrow, but that's all right. I ain't business in who having sex with who. Do not interfere with children. And do not force your sexual preference down my throat. If you want to go and be with a man, go and be with a man. Don't tell me I must accept it. If you want to be with a woman, go and be with a woman. Don't tell me I must accept it. And don't come parading it in this public either. That's my position. Yes, Mr. Burke. It didn't matter. I am I, you know. Yeah, that's that's based. It's we have the historic positions, and it comes down to persons 
We are an individualistic culture. Let me go from that angle. And persons seem to think that they can interpret scripture how they like, when they like, with, re with disregard for the church's historic position. Scripture is part of the tradition of the church. And as such, it comes under the authority of the church. And so the very structure of our liturgy provides an interpretation of scripture. So, when somebody says to me, um, it is myself, the scripture, and the Holy Spirit, I have a fundamental problem there. I have a fundamental problem right there. Okay. So it is the interpretation that has caused a lot of the problems. Because, so for example, the Roman Catholic Church, in one of its declarations, says that the Anglican orders are null and void. Because during the Reformation time, they felt that Archbishop Matthew Parker's ordination was devout of form and intention. And so, the, so all Anglican orders they claim thereafter um, was defective. That's their interpretation. We don't accept that. We feel and we believe that we are duly, properly ordained persons within the one Catholic and Apostolic Church. Okay? And so I, I have a fundamental disagreement with um, the Roman position that if an Anglican priest goes over to them, they have to be reordained. That is a slap in the face. I would never accept that. I prefer to go home and do agriculture than go, go over. Yes, my brother. But for me, the second one that you mentioned, because um, I will go on to show and to suggest that although it is shrouded in controversy, it has an essential role in how we develop and grow as church by virtue of the fact that it engages. It engages. I mean, look at all the issues. I mean, in the New Testament, there are different ecclesiologies. I mean, almost all of the letters in the New Testament have a different understanding of church. Okay? But they always seem to revolve around a central idea. Jesus is Lord. In a similar way, though the controversies within the Anglican church stretches our imagination, the Anglican Church as a body still hold on to the notion that we are one Catholic and apostolic. Okay? However that is interpreted and shifted, that still remains along with scripture, tradition, and reason. Okay? And so we, we grow out of that. So over time, over time, we are creating a new, a new, a richer understanding of the truth and of the church. But we cannot be afraid to, con to have these discussions. Change erupts out of conflict all the time. Because when people are settled and complacent, nothing happens. 
but it is how you manage the conflict. And perhaps Archbishop Wellaby's notion, let us disagree, but disagree well. Hence, he has termed this Lambeth Conference God's Church for God's People. And the way he is going to try and um, fashion it would take certain of the controversies off center stage, but nonetheless still on the stage. Okay. Yes. So what is because emo- that's my thing, eh? it is e- what is emerging in terms of the Anglican Communion, though it is happening in controversy, it is still a worthwhile evolution within the church. Catherine. Comments, thoughts? Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Yes, go ahead. No, it doesn't. Action that flow from those interpretations. But you see, what would ha- what for that to happen? Somebody, some group, some body has to hold the core of it together. The thing with the thing, the thing is this: if you have a good, strong central core, then you can have things at the periphery. Disagreements, this, this, at the periphery. Because the center could hold. The problem becomes when the center cannot hold. Okay? And that is why I said, at the moment, the center that holds for us is that we believe essentially in the one Catholic, Holy, and Apostolic Church. And that is the center around which we gravitate. Different writers, different thinkers have interpreted them differently, but they are the reference point. Good. Right. Okay. 
And with his point, I would have said that um, the important thing for us is to acknowledge that we are created in God's image, that men and women are created equally yet different. And that we are meant to live in community where respect, cooperation, and justice and love dwells. Not manipulation, not discrimination, not control. Okay. Um, but invariably those things sometimes take center stage, which is unfortunate. Good. All right. Thank you all for coming. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, continue to widen our vision with a sense of who you are. And may this understanding of who you are help us in our worship of you and in our living together in community. Bless us individually and collectively. This is our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Do get home safely. Thank you. Um, it's okay. Good.